just going to, to make a start, and I'm really sorry to keep you waiting, but we, we have quite extraordinary circumstances in which this seminar is taking place. Um, my name is Liz McKeaty, and I'm the Director of the Institute of Race Relations. And I'm really, really humbled um, to be asked by the Justice of Jeremiah campaign to welcome you here today. Before I say the sort of normal things, telling you how the day is going to pan out, I think um, Erica, Erica Dubbin, would just like to say a few words um, to welcome you. Well, welcome everybody, and I, I don't know where to start with my thanks, and I, I think I will start with thank you to speaking with Bacchetti and Francis Weber from the Institute of Race Relations because it's thanks to their support and their encouragement that we're here meeting today and that we've got this opportunity, which is so important, I think, to review what's gone on in the last 12 years and at the same time to um, look into all the issues that were neglected and were not explored in the three-day inquest that we just had and that I think um, pertain to my, what I would like to be my son's legacy, um, that we understand far more about the dangerous, the dangers of extremist groups, whether they call them cults or sects or uh, fascist organisations. These kind of groups and the sort of methods that they use, the dangers they expose, and how it works in the political scene. And I am very, very grateful to the speakers that are coming this morning and we've got them on our program because each one has something to contribute. And I also hope that the word will spread to students because those are, those are people who really are aiming at health workers. We, we really want them to know about the kind of organisation that I think will destroy my son. So I have to also thank my own lawyers, Lee Day, um, and Mary Vardy, my um, barrister, um, Anthony Metzer, and, sorry, QC, Anthony Metzer, and barrister Aaron Rollin, um, and uh, also Francis Swain from Lee Day. So I've had, a, I've had a many, uh, much support from the legal team in Britain, but Absolutely, the, one of the biggest thanks has to go to my German lawyer, who's been absent, who's been devoted for the last six years, has put up with me, and I've not been easy, and has also put up with the German prosecutor, which has been well, easy wouldn't be the word, has treated him deplorably, and I will go into that this afternoon if he'll allow me to. But he's he's been here. He, he didn't speak at the inquest, but he will be speaking this afternoon. And I really look forward to hearing and learning so much more from our speakers today, and I give them a big welcome. Um, Eric has said many of the facts um, that, that I wanted to make. Um, so I'll just tell you a few things about the, the structure of the day. But before I do that, I wanted to just tell you a little bit about how the day came about. Um, because it's really been quite extraordinary. Uh, from my point of view, I don't think that I've ever been involved in organising a seminar which takes place in such extraordinary emotional and charged atmosphere. Um, and it's a little miracle that the seminar ever came about, actually. So, you know, you are all present at a miracle. Um, and I'll tell you why it's a miracle. Because we had no idea whether the inquest would actually have come to a conclusion and whether there would have been a verdict yesterday. We had a good idea that it would be finished because this was the second inquest. Um, and you'll hear more about the justice aspects in the afternoon. So we had a good idea because three days had been set aside for it that the proceedings would have ended, but we didn't know whether the coroner would have reached a verdict. And if he hadn't reached a verdict, we were under strict instructions about what we could discuss today because we could have prejudiced the coroner's verdict. And at one point, I even thought of asking Francis Weber, who's um, a lawyer at the Institute of Race Relations, to bring a whistle and blow the whistle if anyone actually sort of said anything. Um, that could have been considered prejudicial. So, mercifully, we're 
they're not in that situation, although um, some aspects of the coroner's findings, uh, which we will talk about this afternoon, um, there are further things to be said. Obviously, uh, the main theme of the day is, has justice been done for Jeremiah? And there's been, it's been 12 years seeking justice with so many twists and turns in this campaign. It's absolutely unbelievable. But I think that Erica and Hugo stand alongside uh, Mr. and Mrs. Lawrence. They stand alongside so many families who fought for justice in this country. And I think they're just such amazing people. Uh, so the day is actually going to be split into two parts. This, which is in a sense a recognition of the two different um, aspects of the fight for justice. The morning being the aspect of um, the whole question of far-right political cults and anti-Semitism within those cults and the, the tactics they use to draw young people in. And I mean we've got an amazing array of experts um, to speak to you this morning, but what I would say is they're not just experts, really. They're, they're Erica and Hugo's friends. <coughs> they're people who have supported them, like Chip and Matthew, who will be speaking first, who supported them over the last uh, 12 years. And Matthew and also Eves, who's here, alongside myself and Francis, were the people who really tried to, to bring this seminar together. So we've got a, a very packed morning and it's going to be difficult because people have so much to say but we hope to be able to carry out proceedings in such a way so there'll be enough time for the audience to also contribute and we've built space into the day as well so at the end of the day there's uh, much more time for a, a, an open discussion and then you know the second half of the day after lunch um, is where we're going to really focus on the justice aspects of this campaign and um, what I have to say from the outside is people like Matthew and Chip and Eves have been with uh, Erica and Hugo since the beginning. From the point of view of the Institute of Race Relations, we were aware and following the case right from the beginning. We were writing it up in our bulletins um, at, the, at the Institute. But really we only came in as a supporter about a couple of years ago. And that was because then we felt we had something to offer the campaign. And it really has come out of our work in Germany, where we've been working with the uh, lawyers representing the victims of the National Socialist Underground, who murdered uh, 11 people, mostly of Turkish origin, uh, went undetected um, by the police. Well, police and intelligence services were running a paid informer scheme within the main neo-Nazi party in Germany. And we began to see parallels between the institutional response to Jeremiah's death and the institutional response to the National Democratic Party of Germany and the National Socialist Underground. And obviously we can talk about that more in the afternoon. But from my point of view, what I feel has been disappointing in terms of the inquest proceedings, which is not a, a mechanism of truth, request, truth recovery, it's just a forum to find the sequence of events uh, in the death is that there's too much trust based on the German criminal justice system. I think we in Britain have stereotypes of German uh, criminal justice system being very efficient, but actually there's no inquest system, there's no police complaints mechanism, there's no transparency, and we'll be talking about that more in the afternoon. Uh, just to conclude, we have to thank Golden Court Chambers for allowing us to have this really comfortable <coughs> venue and I know that was really important to Erica. Um, Erica is an amazing person because she just worries about the details so much. When we first said that we were going to organise a seminar, the first thing she was worried about was what she was going to give you to eat for lunch, and I'm not joking. <laughs> And I said to Erica, look, Erica, there's lots of places they can go out and get a sandwich and bring it back. And so if there's anyone to blame for the lack of food, it's me, it's not Erica. Um, I just want to say in conclusion that my good friend Stafford Scott, who's one of the leaders of the black community here in London, is fond of saying, there's no justice, there's just us. And I hope at the end of today's proceedings that Erica and Hugo will feel that the just us 
is not just their family, not just the friends of Jeremiah, but it's all of us in the room. We're, they're not alone, and we're part of their extended family. Thank you. We're going to go straight into the first session, um, just to save time. And um, this is again another failure in the administration down to us that we didn't actually print off any agendas. But there's, there's this around at various places of the room where you can actually um, find out more about the speakers. And the first session is on double speak, coded racism and political extremism. And we've got two great uh, presenters here who are going to present for about 20 to 25 minutes each. And then hopefully we'll have some time for discussion before another coffee break. Um, and who, who's that in person? I'm going to ask you that. Okay. So just to introduce them, it's uh, Professor Matthew Feldman, who has been with the family from the beginning. He's a professor of history and modern ideas at Teesside University and the co-director of the Centre for Fascist, Anti-Fascist and Post-Fascist Studies. And I understand he gave a brilliant expert um, report at the inquest yesterday, so we're really looking forward to hearing from him. We're also incredibly privileged to have Chip Burnett, Burnet, sorry Chip, <laughs> we went through that before and I got it wrong, Chip Burnet um, from the United States and I went on Chip's uh, website uh, yesterday and it's unbelievable uh, the amount of things he's done, he's been a paralegal, he's been an investigative journalist, he's written a book on right-wing populism in America, He's a board member of Defending Dissent and, most interestingly, on the website, Trout Unlimited, which I have no idea what that is, but it sounds good. <laughs> so, uh, without further ado, we'll come over to Matthew. Thank you very much, Liz. Wow, um, quite a morning, and yesterday was quite a day. Um, I'm sure we had a lot of chance to, to talk about one of the more important bits, but um, many of you I've had the pleasure of meeting before, some of you I haven't, although I've been reading about you, so um, my apologies for just getting stuck in. I'll try to be as quick as I can, but some of my images and texts are going to have to speak for me um, just due to time constraints. So that's my talk there, and that's going to be my guiding uh, sort of idea by Pierre Andre Taguif, who wrote on the Front National in France, suggesting that vigilance was only a game of recognizing something already well known, like Nazism or Italian fascism. It would only be a question of remembering, if only. Let me start out actually not talking about the far right, but with a truism. Modern politics relies enormously upon shaping the message towards targeted groups and constituencies. Whether it's Labour's controls on immigration or the Tories' blue-collar cabinet, so called on either side of the recent 2015 general election in Britain, reaching beyond the core base of activists is now widely recognized as a key ingredient in political success. I hope I'm not saying anything terribly uh, contentious. <laughs> this is no less true, however, of the far right in Europe and the US since 1945, albeit manifested in a very different way. The issue is ultimately a simple one, I think. Far-right activists have long tended to be racist or xenophobic, and as we shall see, since 1945, sympathetic to newer forms of fascism and anti-Semitic ploys, like Holocaust denial or its cousin, Holocaust revisionism, which we'll look at. In post-war Europe and in the US, these are scarcely vote winners. It scarcely needs to be said, meaning that the transnational far-right has had to go much further in shaping its message than mere political calculation or triangulation, something that might better be described as a kind of fifth column discourse, a radical right rhetoric that is sanitized in order to challenge liberal democracy from within. Exemplifying this, just brief uh, example from someone that many of you will have known about, that lovely neo-Nazi Nick Griffin, recently deposed scumbag leader of the British National Party and today the UK's most electorally successful far-right group. He called this embrace very specifically verbal judo shortly after taking over the leadership of this neo-fascist party. There you can see him saying, we must teach the truth to the hardcore. 
but we also have to use verbal judo terms <coughs> to do it. These are some of the scholarly terms, which you can't see there. It says esoteric, exoteric, front stage, back stage. I'll say a bit about that in a moment. But again, some of these are going to have to talk for me. So I hope that it's OK. Can you see in the back there? This separation between hardcore fascists and the public was influentially put forward in Cass Muda's landmark study from 2000, The Ideology of the Extreme Right, which claimed that such groups typically have a moderate front stage intended for public consumption and a radical backstage targeted at activists. Still earlier, another scholar on far-right ideology named Roger Eatwell perceived an exoteric and an esoteric division in the 1980s National Front. And I know that we may hear about other types of distinctions that uh, um, approximate this. Applying this formula to the leadership as a whole under his so-called modernizing leadership, and I confess this is my most, um, this is my favorite slide coming up here. It's really quite extraordinary. This is verbal judo in practice, made abundantly clear in April 2009. It's a leaked internal document in the lead up to the European elections that May, which of course brought two MEPs for the British National Party. This is circulated in the perfectly Orwellian title BNP Language and Concepts Discipline Manual. I'm just going to read you the first one. The BNP is not a racist party. No. Now, in my experience, when the first of your rules is we're not racist, it probably means that you're racist, basically. Some of the other rules are equally telling in terms of this verbal judo or front stage, backstage. Whatever you wish to call this, turn towards euphemism, one that is seductive in deploying the language of inclusion and democracy for xenophobic and for illiberal ends. And don't forget, their manifesto in 2005 was called Rebuilding British Democracy. Not, we hate British democracy, not such a good vote-getter in Britain. These radical right ideologues and movements, in short, show that leopards have not changed their spots so much as finding rather better cover, especially online, as we'll look at. This presentation is going to attempt a very broad and general survey of some of the issues at play in terms of the post-war far right before focusing on some of these double-speak tactics as they can be seen in the LaRouche group, time permitting. Uh, I have a lot of quotations, and we'll see how we get on. If you start throwing things at me, I'll speed up. There are a number of uh, other aspects that we might discuss here, uh, in, uh, above and beyond Holocaust denial and anti-Semitism, uh, including anti-Muslim prejudice. Um, here, an ex another example by Nick Griffin saying, after 7-7, Islamophobia is being played by, like a scratch CD. This is a real vote getter for us. But my focus is again going to be largely on the hatred of Jews and denial of the Holocaust in the post war world. And I've probably said that term, post war world, now four or five times. So why 1945? To start off with the scale of defeat of the Axis powers, and with it, any support for fascism in Europe and the US amongst the wider public made that ideology quite simply a toxic one. While long associated with violence and militarism, fascist ideology swiftly became a synonymous with savagery and extermination in the European and American mind. And for good reason, of course, 50 million dead in Europe, 6 million of them Jews systematically murdered in the specially constructed death chambers, the Shoah or Holocaust, whose pitiless symbol is Auschwitz-Birkenau still to this date the largest gravesite in human history. Put simply, classic fascism of Mussolini's and Hitler's stripe was so wholly discredited and in places illegal, so twinned with evil after 1945, that politically drawing upon that legacy, explicitly returning to classic fascism, was simply impossible. Some of the more intelligent members of the old guard of these classic fascists, like Oswald Mosley in Britain, or Maurice Bardèche in France, who we'll see in a moment, realized that at the very least, the outward trappings of fascism, the shirts and the rallies, the overt anti-Semitism, the revolutionary politics, needed to be consigned to socio-political oblivion. This is Bardèche, Bardèche talking about what is fascism, translated from the French 1961. Just draw your attention with another name, another face, and with nothing which betrays the projection from the past. That was the goal already in the early 1960s. That was a realization that a new approach was needed. Doubling down 
on what the Nazis or the Italian fascists did was not going to get them out of any ghettos, electoral or otherwise. And just to remain with France for a moment, well, arguably what became fascist ideology was incubated first before the World War, War, First World War by the likes of Georges Sorel or Charles Maurras's Option Francais. Now a new type of far-right politics emerged after World War II, taking Bardesh's warnings very much to heart. In the words of the respected scholar of the French far-right, Jens Ridgren, he talked about a new innovative master frame, and that this was something that we saw in the Front National in 1984. Again, I'm not going to read through all of these just because of time, so um, if you do find something, I'm very happy to send on things. Um, <laughs> my point is that this euphemistic master frame met with surprising success in 1984 when Jean-Marie Le Pen, not in a Nazi uniform but a suit, appears on French television not to shout and scream and berate, but to seemingly reasonably discuss his party's politics. It transformed the electoral fortunes of the Front National. And in keeping with this new shift of emphasis, soon to be felt across post-Cold War Europe and a far-right resurgence that included the FPO in Austria, under York Heider, the Vlaams Bloc in Belgium, the MSI in Italy, and many, many more. In 1987, Le Pen notoriously declared, this has been the press recently, I'm not saying the gas chambers didn't exist, I haven't seen them myself, I haven't particularly studied the question, it's just a detail of the history of World War II. For these remarks, he was convicted in France and later in Germany for similar statements, which he reiterated again earlier this year. This was classic, I'm going to use this word maybe advisedly, it's classic dog whistle politics. Can I just ask, do people know what I mean by that in this room? Well, this is kind of talking to different groups of people. I got in trouble for this yesterday. I'll explain later. This was dog whistle politics for the hardcore. One explanation for this reiteration, this doubling down on Holocaust revisionism, is that his daughter, Marina, who now leads the party founded originally in 1972, has moved in a still more publicly moderate, certainly philo-Semitic direction, shifting her focus, as has been common amongst the new far right of the last generation, this, this century, away from anti-Semitism and toward anti-Muslim prejudice, towards immigration and towards hostility to the EU project. At any rate, as a result, earlier this month, Jean-Marie Le Pen was indefinitely suspended from the FN at the hands of his daughter, who, on the one hand, He's disowned, being the black sheep in the family. And on the other, the party itself is now perhaps the biggest political party in France and has fully 23 European parliamentary, parliamentarians since last year. Nevertheless, we can see other areas where this new master <coughs> frame has also emerged and been successful on its own terms, not on ours. Indeed, the first stirrings of Holocaust denial in the late 1960s and 1970s tried to sanitize fascism, uh, and especially Nazism, by claiming to disprove either part or all of the Holocaust. At first, in the 50s and 60s, writes Sir Richard Evans, their writings were instead, quote, mostly distributed by mail order and of a caliber, quote, that seemed to belong in the world of sensational newspapers, such as you could buy in American supermarkets. <coughs> to testify to this, he goes on to say, recounting the experience of people who have been abducted by little green aliens or who had seen Elvis Presley alive. A classic example of this uh, um, approach is the dodgy 1974 pamphlet called Did Six Million Really Die? Richard, written by so-called Richard Harwood. Not his real name. His real name was Richard Verrill, who was the deputy director at the time of the National Front. Just to be clear, it was written by a neo-Nazi who hated Jews. The motive of anti-Jewish hatred, in turn, takes us back to the wartime Holocaust, the most horrifying expression of anti-Semitic hatred and genocide in history. And it bears mentioning that the first people to systematically deny the extermination of Europe's Jews and millions of others so-called undesirable were the Nazis themselves and their collaborators. It bears remembering that elites in the Third Reich destroy evidence ranging from documents to crematoria. They set up an entire Zondra commando called 1005 to destroy evidence of the Action Reinhard camps. They exhumed and burned already desecrated corpses, and they kept the existence of their so-called final solution to the Jewish question itself a euphemism. 
as great a secret as possible during the Second World War. So that simple point is that the Nazis were the first Holocaust deniers, and most of the people who do it ideologically are following in that same vein. Yet if these early Holocaust deniers were obviously writing within a clear anti-Semitic framework, typically alleging Jewish or now Zionist conspiracies to either invent or inflate or exploit the historical Holocaust, here too, doublespeak was able to manipulate the message. Think of, for example, the Institute of Historical Review, a clearinghouse of nearly four decades for well-circulated, now largely online, Holocaust denial and so-called revisionism. Its acronym, IHR. <coughs> now I ask a London-based audience who's heard of IHR. Anyone? Institute for Historical Research. It is not an accident. It is not an accident. It is currently run, not the Institute for Historical Research, they kick him out of town, but by Mark Weber, who runs the Institute of Historical Review. And again, same MO, white supremacist, rabidly anti-Semitic member of the National Alliance. He was in London only the last month for a gathering of more than 100 Holocaust deniers. The gold standard of these people, of course, David Irving, had long been a denier of the Holocaust, calling it an allied propaganda exercise but posed as a seemingly reasonable, professional, if revisionist historian while doing so. His books, correspondingly, are heavily laden with footnotes, academic jargon, and other forms of intellectual camouflage, like, like mine. <laughs> Irving had an important fringe following in the 1980s and 1990s, especially amongst the far right, when he sued Penguin Books and Deborah Lipstadt for libel after she claimed in her 1993 denying the Holocaust of growing assault on truth and memory, that Irving was a dangerous spokesperson for Holocaust denial. I'm going to slip, skip forward here because of time, but I'll just point out that after an extensive trial in 1996, it was found, really it was putting the Holocaust on trial as well as David Irving to test the factual evidence. Judge Gray found that Irving had significantly misrepresented, misconstrued, omitted, mistranslated, misread, and applied double standards to the historical evidence in order to achieve his ideological presentation of history. His ideological presentation of history. As a general modus operandi, this example of ideological deception could apply to far-right doublespeak more generally. Here's a couple of quotes in support, one from The Beast Reawakens by Martin Lee and another by a, a recent scholar named Matthew Goodwin who worked for the far-right here in the UK. And again, they're going to have to speak for me, I'm afraid. But the point is, they downplay their fascist credentials and extremist discourse, as Goodwin says, to promote an image of political legitimacy and electoral credibility. As with classic fascism, so too with anti-Semitism. For instance, commenting on the German far-right scene in 2002, here is a report by the Office for the Protection of the Constitution which claimed that anti-Semitism, hatred of Jews, was an essential ideological ingredient of the far right in Germany, but it added this caveat. All relevant extreme right parties and factions work with anti-Semitic stereotypes. They just don't use specific terms. And this is called communication latency. And so now with my remaining seven-ish, seven and a bit minutes, you guys are keeping me on that. All right, six and a half minutes, six and three quarters minutes, I want to turn to LaRouche, who had his own form of communication latency. There you can see it is not necessary to wear a brown shirt to be a fascist. It's not necessary to wear a swastika. It's not necessary to call himself a fascist. It is simply necessary to be one. This forms the frontispiece of Dennis King's 1989 expose, aptly titled Lyndon LaRouche and the New American Fascism. Helen Gilbert described LaRue's in similar terms, something strange and cultish and etc. Uh, et up here, but underneath the weirdness, a far-right worldview that is ultimately consistent internally, and is almost, I sometimes think, deliberately employed to throw people off track. We could discuss that a little bit later. Sweden knows far more about the movement uh, than I do. My point is that as with the new far-right as a whole, this rhetorical throwing people off track Best comes into focus by taking the long view, and I would say this, of course, as a historian. 
There are three characteristics of the LaRouche movement briefly that I want to look at as a short case study of this far right manipulation of language, especially as it relates to fascism and Holocaust revisions. When it comes to the LaRouche movement, there's no shortage, it should be said, of material. And with Chip Relay at my side, I don't need to say too much about the history of the movement. But suffice it to say that publishing is one thing this sect does extremely well and has a range of publication titles, all ultimately run by Lyndon and his wife, Helga Zepp, the Rouge. Over the years, they've involved sophisticated methods for encoding their anti-Semitism in far-right politics. In addition to Holocaust revisionism, I want to look briefly at two techniques the Rouge has honed over the years as a far-right ideologue. There you see my big academic polysyllabic words, basically inversion and symbolism, okay? Calling other people fascists and Nazis and using an individual Jewish person or other as representative of the whole group. And there you can see there, in 1973, it's pretty overt. They don't even bother really coding it. Cleansing, Nazi Jewish lobby. But by 1978, and I think very importantly, by the white screen, a year of increased contact with Willis Parto, the notorious anti-Semite and founder of the Institute for Historical Review, language had become somewhat more subtle in terms of anti-Semitism. Either you as a Jew join with the U.S. Labor Party, or you are as implicitly guilty of the death of millions of Jews as Adolf Hitler. You either join us or you're a Nazi, it's clear. And what I want to point out in these techniques is threefold. First, it attempts to deny central aspects of the Holocaust, to marginalize suffering, to relativize guilt, to question facts and shift blame away from the perpetrators of the final solution. Second, it attempts to sanitize fascism by referring to one's own enemies as Nazis, fascists, mass murderers, genocidaires, <laughs> and so on. Fascism's crimes are both normalized and applied to perceived enemies. I can give some other examples in discussion should we want. Third, it uses individual Jews as anti-Semitic code. This reference to Rohatan and Friedman above is symbolic metonymy for Jews generally. In this way, anti-Semites deliberately disguise their attacks on Judaism by singling out bad Jews, wealthy or powerful individuals, political supporters of Zionism, and of course, anything remotely connected to Israel, which is consistently portrayed as a Nazi-like state. As a result, actual fascist and Nazi actions, especially the final solution, are systematically trivialized. They return within the boundaries of normal human behavior. Additionally, enemies are vilified, dehumanized, monster. They are the ones considered to be conspirators and mass murderers, the very embodiment of evil. These individuals are typically Jews who are very prominent in public life. Kissinger, Brzezinski, people with even Jewish sounding names. Therefore, Zionists are the real Nazis and fascists, and combining them was the task of the Rushite humanism. It's because for LaRouche, an evil oligarchy defined as Jewish-British, conspiracy put forward by a number of early, early 20th, sorry, early and mid 20th century American racists, lies at the root of the world's problems. It is this needing to be eradicated by LaRouche's devoted followers. Now I'm going to fast forward, unfortunately time is against me, and look at the way in which this has been shaped and honed around 2003 and more recently. This is after a, a handful, a couple of handfuls of failed Democratic presidential nominations, a stint in jail for fraud, and in 2003 LaRouche is still at it, and there you can see Prescott Bush move the money to refinance the Nazi party and to bring Hitler to power. The Nazis weren't responsible for bringing the Nazis to power. Uh, context or Germany, no, no. It's the people we don't like. They're the ones who are bringing the Nazis to power. A classic person was Leo Strauss in the frame for the growth of Nazism and Hitler's rise to power. There you can see that's this fascist Strauss created Wolfowitz, blah, blah, blah. Allegedly, once in America, Leo Strauss influenced rich Jews, British agents, and politicians, including, of course, the neoconservatives. And there again, you get more of the same, frankly, drivel. Amongst a number of symbolic Jewish targets, and I'm concluding, <coughs> Strauss is accused by LaRouche of supporting Hitler's rise to power, of having been involved in September 11th, and of promoting warfare in the Middle East. 
As Lerner put it a year later, Leo Strauss was responsible for America marching down the road to self-inflicted hell. Zionists are the real Nazis and fascists, and combining them was the task of the Rushite humanism. It's because for the Rush, an evil oligarchy defined as Jewish-British, conspiracy put forward by a number of early, early 20th, sorry, early and mid 20th century American racists, lies at the root of the world's problems. It is this needing to be eradicated by the Rush's devoted followers. Now I'm going to fast forward. Unfortunately, time is against me. And look at the way in which this has been shaped and honed around 2003 and more recently. This is after a handful, a couple of handfuls of failed Democratic presidential nominations, a stint in jail for fraud. And in 2003, LaRouche is still at it. And there you can see Prescott Bush move the money to refinance the Nazi party and to bring Hitler to power. The Nazis weren't responsible for bringing the Nazis to power. Uh, context or Germany, no, no. It's the people we don't like. They're the ones who are bringing the Nazis to power. A classic person was Leo Strauss in the frame for the growth of Nazism and Hitler's rise to power. There you can see that's, this fascist Strauss created Wolfowitz, blah, blah, blah. Allegedly, once in America, Leo Strauss influenced rich Jews, British agents, and politicians, including, of course, the neoconservatives. And there again, you get the point the same, frankly, drivel. Amongst the number of symbolic Jewish targets, and I'm concluding, <coughs> Strauss is accused by the Rouge of supporting Hitler's rise to power, of having been involved in September 11, and of promoting warfare in the Middle East. As the Rouge put it a year later, Leo Strauss was responsible for America marching down the road to self-inflicted hell. This suggests that, like the British, the Jews and their supporters stand accused of being fascists and Nazis, and of course that age-old chest fund of being monopolistic conspirators. It is not merely that LaRouche uses special language and redefinitions to hide direct references to the Jews. In addition, he, he deploys Jewish sounding names or stereotypical references to convey his underlying message. There is, of course, a proliferation of ridiculous epithets Kabbalist, Venetian, locust, usurer, or Babylonian, that to the uninitiated sound frankly bizarre. But they are stock anti Semitic code. Through innuendo, and in particular metonymy, the Rushite propaganda returns to blaming Jews for every problem facing the world. And that was when a white guy was in the way at the White House. Unfortunately, what we got since Barack Obama took over was something much more noxious. The Rouge graduated, if that is the right word, from suggesting that the, uh, Obama was an American fear in 2009-10 to opaquely calling for his killing in 2010 in a webcast <laughs> revealingly titled The Ides of March, i.e. the assassination of Julius Caesar in BC 44. And it says there in the highlighted portion, as with Caesar, time is running out for Barack Obama. These things only went downhill from there, as my, you'll be happy to know, penultimate slide makes clear. Stock racist things going back only several years. Really some pretty noxious racism. And I think important is this slide. Sorry. This is from a, a white pride worldwide um, stormfront website, and you can't see it terribly well. The top one says, LaRouche, Obama-Hitler correlation. I saw this picture of Obama depicted with a Hitler mustache, blah, blah, blah. Who is this guy, LaRouche? Answered by Europa 88, 88 standing for Heil Hitler, so no prizes for guessing what his value system are. Quote, he is apparently a guy advocating our cause by using politically correct terms so as not to be labeled an anti-Jew. He has some very interesting writings, especially about the Federal Reserve. It's classic <laughs> dog whistle stuff. And these are the people that know how to act on that dog whistle. So in conclusion, when it comes to LaRouche, a familiar response is that he was unhinged or so eccentric as to be laughable. That may be true for those of us outside this bubble, unable to hear this dog whistle. But as with the wider far right doublespeak as a whole, I think it misses the wood through the trees. 
For the far right will not simply show the same face with the same jackboots and salutes and manifestos as they did 70 years ago. They too know their own toxic history, perhaps better than we do in this room. Hopefully the wise words of Umberto Eco 20 years ago can serve as a warning for us today going forward for the next generation, not that words. It would be so much easier if there appeared on the world scene somebody saying, I want to reopen Auschwitz. I want the black shirts to parade again in the Italian squares. But life is not that simple. Or a fascism that he was describing can come back under the most innocent of disguises. Our duty is to uncover it and to point our finger at any of its new instances every day and in every part of the world. And I thank Erica Duggan in particular for helping me to see yet another one in the Rouge organization. Long may all of us in this room continue to work on that.